Hi, I'm David Domke. I'm chair of the Department of Communication here at the University of Washington. Um, and every once in a while I get a chance to do what we call Chats with the Chair. It's an opportunity to talk to an alum or a, a student or a faculty member or staff member just about their lives, their work, and how it all connects to communication. I'm thrilled to be joined today by a gentleman who's going into our Alumni Hall of Fame this evening, Jay Molino. And Jay is up here for the Bay, from the Bay Area right now, and so thanks for joining me, Jay. It's great to be back on campus. <laughs> thanks, David. <laughs> now, you were on campus 1982 alum, is that correct? 82, right. And you yeah. were, so you came in the late 70s, early 80s. What was, what's a kind of a memory or kind of, how do you remember that experience? Uh, for me, it, it was a, a large place because I was from a smaller town in upstate New York. And when I came here, it was a pretty big city. And, mm -hmm. um, but I found the campus to be uh, very welcoming. And I, you know, I had great uh, counselors and, and teachers, lots of great mentors. It, it, it felt like home, even though it was a large place. And I, in the end, I appreciated the size of it because there was so much here there's so many classes and so much to learn. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be like at least a triple major. There was so many things I was interested in. So there's a lot of opportunities here. Yeah, and you, uh, I mean, I know that feeling of how large the campus can just feel daunting at first, right? Mm -hmm. But over time, did, did you kind of settle in and begin to find your people, your friends, your areas? Yeah, I, I was admitted to, to the school through EOP, the Educational Opportunity mm -hmm. Program. So initially that was my community. and. I worked for that department. I actually helped recruit other students. So, mm -hmm. and I helped a lot of kids from small towns in Washington adapt to being in a, in a large city as well, because a lot of them were homesick. And I was a peer counselor for a lot of those those mm -hmm. kids initially. But that was a community of mine initially. And then um, when I when I got involved in dance, that was another community that I found. I was in the University of Washington Dance Theater, and I hung mm -hmm. around. I hung around with a lot of those kids for quite a lot. Um, so there's lots of different communities here on campus that you can connect with, lots of student activities. Uh, my, the woman who was my counselor in EOP went on to run the student activities oh. division, so she remained a good friend, so I stayed really connected to a lot of the student activities. So now when you graduated from here, as my, I understand that you went to, you got a master's degree from Columbia University mm -hmm. in organizational psychology, and then you began to do work in philanthropy and the arts, and you, you danced for a while too, didn't you? Right, yeah. yes, exactly. Well, dance was really my original passion, and that's what I wanted to do, uh, which is why I ended up going to New York, because I wanted mm. to give that a shot. Okay. And fortunately, um, and that's a hard thing to do, and it, did, you know, it, was, it didn't work out for me, and I'm glad I went to New York and gave that a try. I'm also glad that at the time I was, a lot of my friends were, were going to Columbia and I just was kind of hanging out there <laughs> and I eventually applied for a job there and got a job in the development department. Okay. Then I realized that one of the benefits was tuition exemption. Oh, sure, sure. And I looked for a program that I could do part time and I ended up with a master's degree for basically nothing. So that's a good deal. Like that's a good Columbia. deal. Yeah. That's a great deal. Um, I, wanted, I initially thought I might do the journalism program there. Mm -hmm. I took one journalism class, but that's a full-time program. You can't do mm -hmm. that part-time. There's very few programs you can do part-time there. Mm -hmm. One of them was organizational psychology, which, which was the closest thing I thought I could get to getting a, a business degree. Why did you get involved in kind of uh, philanthropy, what we call at the university development or advancement, where you're cultivating relationships with donors, with supporters, and kind of helping them to connect their their resources with campus uh, uh, places where they can support the work. What what drew you to that? Well, when like I said, when I first got the job there, I didn't know what I was applying for. It's one of those where I just applied for an ad, and it sounded interesting. It was with the university relations department, which turned out to be alumni relations and development. I worked in corporate relations initially, and um, and I, I had a great mentor there, so he really kind of was key to me becoming very excited about the field. Um, but I just, you know. I realize now all the things that I learned here at the School of Communications, um, how to write, how to make a case, you know, mm. how to listen for and tell stories, 
how to negotiate and persuade, you know, I really, you know, I could utilize all of those fundamental tools that I acquired here, hmm. I could apply to the field of philanthropy. I also just loved helping people, and now I'm helping people give their money away, which I think is the best job in the world because you're basically helping to people to give their money away. <laughs> um, but I'm helping them reconnect to the things that matter most to them, which they often forget about over time especially as they get older, they want to get back to the real meaningfulness of their life. And I help them reconnect with that and I help them create legacy plans that, that are going to live well beyond their lifetime. Hmm. So in the late 1980s, you moved to San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. And did you continue in, in the kind of work of advancement at that time or did you kind of take a sideways and then come back? You know, when I got my master's degree at Columbia, I interviewed with some of the firms downtown. I, I, I almost got a job at NBC because mm -hmm. of my, you know, my, my uh, communications degree, master's in organizational psychology. But at the time, I really loved what I was doing, and I, I loved nonprofit work. And I'd, I talked to enough people that had went to work in for-profit jobs, and I heard what their lives were like. And I decided that I would stay in nonprofit because... The idea of a mission-driven organization instead of a profit-driven organization was much more appealing to me. So I kind of just stuck on that pathway. Hmm. And, and I just had a great connection out at Stanford. When I wanted to go west, I called my friend at Stanford. And within a couple of weeks, I had a call from a headhunter. And I was out there within a couple of months working down in Palo Alto. Hmm. And is this, is this when you got the position with the ballet? Or did you a couple steps to get there? I, it was, it took, I really wanted the job at the ballet. My colleague at Columbia at the time, Jane Poland, who did arts development for Columbia, she went on to, to run the GE Foundation. She told me to hmm. call Mac Lowry when I got to San Francisco. Mac had run the, the, the Ford Foundation, wow. retired, and wanted, always wanted to run a ballet company. So he was at San Francisco Ballet. And I called him when I headed out west, and there was nothing available for me at the time. But I kind of kept my eye on that. And within a couple of years, I was there, and I was the associate director of development. Hmm. I want to ask you a question about uh, that is not a career track question. It was a question about said, the fact that you said you called people. And you told them that you were going to come out and that you were looking for yeah. new possibilities. Yeah. That's something that our students are often yeah. terrified to do, mm -hmm. right? They, they feel like, oh, I don't want to bother somebody. So can you talk about how valuable those networks are and that ability to kind of connect with people? Absolutely, and that, that's something that, that I realized, uh, fortunately er, er, learned early on about the power of networks. When I was at Columbia, there was a group called the, the Ivy MIT Stanford Group. So it was all mm -hmm. the, the Ivy schools in MIT and Stanford. I don't know how they got affiliated, but someone decided that that would be a great grouping. So all the conferences that I attended when I was at Columbia were, was that was that, uh, that those cohorts. Um, so I met all the people at Stanford. I met the people at MIT, and, and I, I almost went to Brown at one point. I got recruited mm -hmm. to go to Brown for a period, and I thought about that. But when it came down to me wanting to go to you know to San Francisco, I called Larry Lawler at Stanford, and uh, and he made a connection for me. So um, I, I always tell pe young people now that I meet about, you know, just keep building your networks. And not, it's not just about connecting with someone on LinkedIn and having them as part of your network, but really spending some time um, to let them know what you do, what value you bring to that network, so that when you really need someone for mm -hmm. someone, you can call on them. Um, so I wish I'd done a little bit more of that when I was in school, but I didn't really understand that concept until I got onto graduate school and further, yeah. Sure. So then now for the last however long you've been working at this community foundation in Sonoma County, right? Mm -hmm. You're the vice president of, of uh, advancement or development there, working in community organizations. And so what exactly do you do in your job? So very simply, I tell people that I work with individuals, families, and couples to help them create meaningful philanthropic plans. So, you know, I love working with couples. They often come to me when they're doing estate planning um, and they have $3 million or they have a half a million dollars, it really doesn't matter, but they've worked hard for that money. Typically, that you know, it's not, these are not people that came from money, but they mm -hmm. earned that money and they want to know that something good's going to happen to it after their lifetime. So um, I also work with a lot of people when they've lost a loved one, so they're mm -hmm. typically grieving. So I'm actually kind of a part-time therapist as well <laughs> as a philanthropic coach. Um, 
but I just love being able to, whether you, you know, I always attribute it back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm actually helping people self-actualate toward the end of their lives. Hmm. Wow. So how would you say, like, the 34 years ago, you mm-hmm. graduated from the University of Washington. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> that, that. That seems like a long time. Well, it seems like very recent to me. Yeah. And the reality is that um, has communication, what has it, what does getting a degree in communication been meant to you in terms of the value of the journey you've taken? Well, I think and this is one of the reasons why I picked the degree when I was here. I'm, I'm grateful that I did because I was one of those students that I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, I knew I had a love and a passion for dance, but I also knew how hard it was to actually make a living doing that. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to pick a major. You know, I wanted to be a wildlife science major at one point, but I ended up picking a major that I knew I could do a lot of things with it. You know, I took public relations. I took marketing. I took persuade, you know, whatever it was, and if I look back now, I really do u- utilize all of all of those um, skills. I mean, I, I did television and radio, and you know, I kind of was behind the camera, in front of the camera. Yeah. Um, all of those things have been really helpful for me in, in, in my career. Yeah. Um, so, if you were going to give one piece of advice as we finish up here, one piece of advice to a contemporary student, a current undergraduate student that we have in the Department of Communication, that you would say, you know, you don't want to leave here without having done this this thing or embraced this part of the experience, what would that be? Um, and I'm, I'm biased now because of what I do in life, but I wish that more and more students would leave their university experiences having thought a bit about philanthropy Hmm. and their role in that and because everyone can be a philanthropist. I talk to third graders. My favorite thing in a year as I go, my friend teaches third grade and I go talk to these ninth graders about philanthropy and it's amazing how quickly they pick up the idea and how how they then leave. I I give them buttons that say um, inspired philanthropists and they wear them out, out of the classroom that day but if universities, if schools taught kids that they all could be philanthropists in some way, what a different world we would have. Well, my son is in third grade. He's nine years old. And I just know the things he brings home. And he challenges us all the time. Yeah. Like, what are you yeah. doing? Are you, you can't throw that out. That goes in the recycling, right? Or, or you know, how, how come you're voting for this person, right? Uh-huh. Or, or what about this? And it's really... An, they, they, those kind of the, that sense of that they see the world and its limitless possibilities in a way that we, as we get older, begin to see bounded possibilities, right? Yeah. Well, the thing I love about the ninth graders, every time I go back to the school, they always run out and they, they give me a hug on my leg because that's kind of where they can hug me is on my leg. The third graders, you mean? Yeah, the, ni- the nine-year-olds. The nine-year-olds, the third grade, yeah. yeah. And they call me Mr. J. Oh, yeah. Which I think is kind of pretty cool. That is really cool. I, I can just see it now. If you came to my class, my son would come home and say, Dad, we need to start giving money. You know, we need to think about this. He was, we were spelling archipelago yesterday, and he was so excited because he was getting that concept down. Like, what is an archipelago? So he would do the same thing with philanthropy, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the class that I spoke to a couple of years ago, they always had me back because it's, it's a charter school for the arts. So mm-hmm. they had, they had uh, put together a dance because whenever I go see them, they get me up dancing with them. And <laughs> they invited me back to watch a dance that they had choreographed themselves to Phil Collins' Another Day in Paradise. And it was a dance about the homeless. Really? Yeah. It blew me away. Wow. Um, well, you know, Jay, we, we, uh, we're thrilled to have you becoming a member of our Alumni Hall of Fame. There's really some incredible people that have gone through this program, and we're just honored to have you in that space as well. So thanks for this time. Well, thank you. Thank you for recognizing, uh, especially because I didn't take the typical path that a lot of people Mm -hmm. do with this degree. So thank you for recognizing someone who's uh, really done a lot of their work in philanthropy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm David Domke. I'm chair of the Department of Communication. It's my honor to be in that position here at the University of Washington. And I was speaking with uh, Jay Molino, who's uh, going into our Hall of Fame this 2016. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.